Well, good morning, church. It's week six of E100, and you know when you think about uh, uh, doing a 20-week study, and I know when we announced that, that may have thought, my gosh, that's going to take like forever, but we're one-third of the way through. And in time, and, and when you start thinking about this, it does go by very quickly. And as with every week, I would encourage you to keep reading. And, and if there is something that, that is changing, if you're doing this together uh, and you're finding a benefit in your marriage, or if you're doing this as a family and you're finding a benefit there as an individual, share those stories with us. Uh, we'd love to know how this is making a difference, how this is making an impact in your life. Last week, we, we talked about the top 10 list, the 10 commandments that serve as a guide for our relationships with others, with things, and with God. And the first five books of the Bible are known as the Pentateuch, and we've been spending uh, almost the entire first third of this series there. And that's composed of, of the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then finally, this week, we started to get a break from those, and, and we went into the story of Joshua, who succeeded Moses and led the Israelites into the promised land. And once established, God set a series of judges to settle disputes and help maintain order among the people. And we read some of their stories this week. And then we ended the week with a love story. And you know, some people question why the book of Ruth is even in the Bible, as it seems to fall somewhat out of context with the story of the Israelites and what's going on up to this point. In actuality, Ruth was an ancestor to King David, which probably has a lot to do with this book actually being included in our Bibles. But aside from that, I think there's a lot we can learn through this story, especially about faith and about commitment and about character. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. And we're going to pick up right at the beginning of this story, and we're going to read through verse 18. Hear these words. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife, and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband." Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. And then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. I first met Nicole 
on February 27th, 2009. We were in a pastoral care class together that was on a weekend format, so it met five times over the course of the semester for a couple hours on Friday evenings and then for about eight hours during the day on Saturday. And I still clearly remember walking into the classroom for the first session that we were having and going in on that Friday evening and seeing her sitting at a desk across the room and thinking to myself, that girl is going to change my life. As we went around the room doing introductions, she shared that she was from the Buffalo area. She was a student at United Theological Seminary, and she was simply taking the class at MTSO because it was offered on a weekend format. So as we left Saturday, I noticed a firefighter sticker on the back of her car, and I assumed that her husband was probably a firefighter. I couldn't shake this feeling that something was going on. The next time the class met, she showed up in a different car, which I assumed was her husband's. Turns out it was her mom's. The class ended, the summer began, and then fall semester arrived. I walked into a theology class, and I sat down, and a few minutes later, Nicole walked in and sat down next to me. I was shocked. I was stunned. She had transferred to MTSO and was now living on campus. She didn't have a husband. She was the firefighter. And I was really confused, because that feeling was back. During the course of the class, she was involved in a group presentation and was railroaded by one of the group members, trying to play the nice guy and thinking I could score a date. I talked to her after class and told her I'd be happy to go and get a cup of coffee with her sometime. She didn't say yes. She didn't say no. She turned and walked up the hill toward her apartment. And I thought, well, to heck with her, and got in my car and went home. I dated a few other people from there, but I still couldn't get Nicole out of my mind. And in the spring of 2010, she and I met in a courtyard, and we started talking about Holy Week services, and and she shared with me some ideas. And and as we continued to talk, I invited her to join me to this dinner that, that I had to attend annually for a scholarship fund. And so we went to this dinner together, and and after dinner, we stood on the parking lot talking for a few hours before she sent me home, because I had a paper that was due the next day. So I wrote the fastest paper I've ever written, and then we started texting. And I finally confessed to her through text message that I had this crush on her. And then there was nothing. The phone went dead. (laughs) And then it rang. And I panicked. I thought, now you've done it. But she called and confessed that she, too, was interested in me. We talked until 3 a.m. that morning. Two weeks later, we were talking, and she shared that her grandparents and her, grandpa- or, and her parents had shared an anniversary of July 24th. Now, you know me now well enough to know that I'm a planner. So the first thing I did was open up a calendar and look. And that year, the date hit on a Saturday. In 2011, it hit on a Sunday and wouldn't fall on a weekend again until 2015. I told her that 2010 was too soon, but I didn't want to engage in a long-distance relationship for five years before getting married. I said, it has to be 2011. She said, it does. And then there was more silence. And then she asked, did we just set a wedding date? I said, it would appear so. And the rest, as they say, is history. I tell you this story because of the pursuit. I pursued Nicole like I had never pursued anything in my life. And I did it because I loved her. And because I couldn't shake this feeling that she was going to change my life. And you know what? She did. And she has. And the story of Ruth is one of pursuit as well. And this passage that we read this morning includes this line that's often quoted in weddings. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. You see, Ruth promised Naomi that she was going to give up everything in order to go with her, to protect her, to leave the Moabites, her own people, to become an Israelite. We know from the last few verses of the book of Judges, this is a dark time in Israel's history, but it would have been especially difficult for a couple of widowed women. The idea of leaving one family in order to become a new one is certainly appropriate for a couple who is celebrating their wedding day, 
But for these two women, and, and in this book, there's so much more at stake. It was so much more than romance. Aside from this tale that ends happily ever after with Ruth marrying Boaz, there's a number of things throughout the book of Ruth that teach us about character in the midst of difficult situations. You know, in this time period, there really was no hope for, for two women who were widowed. I mean, Naomi's greatest chance was that a relative would take her in when she got back to Bethlehem. And for Ruth and Orpah, their greatest chance was to go home, to go back to their people and pray for the same for themselves. Naomi told the women that she could promise them nothing, that they should go home. And Orpah, after some resistance, finally decides to go. But Ruth was determined to stay to ensure that her mother-in-law was cared for, even if it came to her own detriment. You see, this isn't just a story about falling in love and, and getting married. It's a story about a, a, a deeper love. Love that, that triumphs even in the midst of uncertainty, even in the midst of troubling circumstances. Because it's through this story of Naomi and Ruth that we see the character of love and what that really looks like. We see that it's loyal. Ruth, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 14, we read that they, they start crying again. These women start crying and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. And yet, Ruth clings to her. Ruth wouldn't leave her side. A woman who was in need, Ruth determined that they would forge ahead together no matter what the outcome was. We see through Ruth that love is optimistic. Despite Naomi trying to talk her out of staying with her, Ruth obviously believed that the two of them were going to have some kind of a better future by sticking together. We see Ruth had this strong work ethic. She was going to stop at nothing to get it done. She was persistent. And in chapter 2, verse 7, she's reported to have gleaned wheat for an entire day without taking a break. Ruth was humble, and she listened to the advice of Naomi when the two of them had developed a plan for how they were going to get Boaz's attention. By giving herself over to Naomi's God, our God, Ruth showed faith placing her trust in a God she believed would help them. And through her loyalty to not only Naomi, but to Boaz as well, Ruth demonstrates this incredible integrity. And Boaz compliments her as a woman who had proven herself not only to him, but to the entire community. You know, one could say that Ruth's character was noble. Because in the midst of these difficult circumstances and being between this rock and a hard place, she chose this selfless act of ignoring her own future, of protecting herself to make sure that Naomi was taken care of. Now because of that, she was richly blessed by God. Not only was she allowed to eat alongside Boaz at mealtime, which was kind of not a custom of those days, he fell in love with her and married her. And the two of them are, are, were blessed by their community. And we can assume that they did live happily ever after. Now, you know that I love my wife, and I, I try every day to be a good husband. Sometimes I make mistakes. You know, with any relationship, we have moments of conflict. And sometimes, even in those moments of distress and conflict, I do a pretty good job of not allowing the ugly parts of who I am to creep out. But at other times, I've said or acted in, in ways that were more destructive than constructive. You know, I can remember one night, the two of us got into a, a disagreement, and, and the conflict starts to escalate, and the argument becomes more intense, and, and our voices start to rise, and I, I think we were in the car, and I finally paused, and I started laughing. And Nicole looks at me, and she goes, what's so funny? I said, do you know what we're even fighting about? She said, No. I said, neither do I. We sort of reminded ourselves that there was no reason to even be arguing. So we stopped. You know, falling in love with someone or with something, that's easy. Beginning a new friendship, that can be exciting and invigorating. Getting a new job where no one knows your past, no one knows who you are. It can be a tremendous blessing at times. Starting something new might be easy for us. But our true character really comes out when the task of keeping whatever that is alive, keeping that love alive, sets in. 
When conflict begins to strain the relationship or when the excitement wears off and the routine sets in, our character is certainly revealed in how well we handle ourselves in times in life when we're dealt a bad hand. The story of Ruth serves to remind us that through times good and bad, our character is always on display. And we can display good character or we can display poor character. And the choice is ultimately ours to make. I mean, we're going to face times of hardship and conflict. And those moments aren't simply just times for us to get through. But they might be moments for us to learn about ourselves. How do we handle those moments? How, how might we grow through them? How much more might we appreciate the good times if we took the opportunity to grow through the bad ones? You know, in, in James 1, 2 through 4, we read, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. And similarly, Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You see, our character grows through how we handle the unfortunate moments in life. It's very easy to be loyal to be hardworking, to be humble, to be faithful when we're happy and everything's going real smooth. It's more difficult. It takes more stamina. It takes more faith to maintain those things when something is wrong or when the path ahead isn't quite clear. And you know, there will be times when we're going to find ourselves sitting at the intersection of uncertainty and fear, but we may need to simply ask ourselves, what is it God's trying to teach me here? What is there for me to learn about myself or about life or about my faith? Instead of trying to back away or choosing the path that is least resistance, sometimes we have to take the chance and, and take that walk through the weeds. Both the writer of James and Paul tells us that the trials in life, they'll help us to grow our character. They'll help us to be able to develop the ability to persevere, even when all seems lost, even when we want to go home with our head down. As, as Naomi told Ruth, she said, just call me Mara, because God has dealt bitterly with me, forgotten about me, even when we want to put our head down and say, just call me Mara. We mustn't lose hope, because God's love has been poured into us through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And when both her husband and father-in-law die, Ruth's world, it came apart. And through this moment of great uncertainty, her character is revealed. She demonstrates loyalty and optimism, hard working and, and submissiveness. She gracefully worked within the customs of her day and yet bucked the trends at the same time. She had faith, she had integrity, and she cultivates this character of nobility and trusted that God would going to bless her as God saw fit. You know, how, how will our character shine through in moments of darkness and light on moments both on the mountains and in the valleys? You know, what kind of character do we want to cultivate? And how might God be blessing us even in those moments that are difficult where we struggle? No matter what life brings your way, don't give up. Lean in. Open your eyes. I guarantee God's got something to show you. Look for it and see what it is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of faith and for the ability to trust in your plans for us. When things don't go the way we had hoped, help us to demonstrate good character, continuing to trust in you, knowing that you do work all things for good. Help us to not get lost in the fog but rather to always walk in your light. This we pray in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I just sanitized, so you're good.
but I won't, I won't feel bad if you just want to give me an elbow bump on your way out this morning. Friends, may you go knowing that whatever comes your way, the victory has already been won. Because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit has gone before, is walking beside you now, and is going on ahead of you. We'll see you next week.